All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the eighth installment of our Acadiana Business Resource webinar series. Uh, my name is Andre Bro, and I work on the team at One Acadiana. Um, and our Acadiana Business Resource webinars are brought to you by uh, a group of partners from across the Acadiana region that includes uh, One Acadiana, LIDA, Opportunity Machine, uh, the Downtown Development Authority, the Louisiana Small Business Development Center at UL Lafayette. Acadiana Workforce Solutions, the United Way of Acadiana, um, and other local chambers and economic development uh, offices from around the Acadiana region. We have come together to support Acadiana's business community, uh, particularly our small businesses, in response to COVID-19 um, by hosting a series of webinars on timely and relevant topics. Today's webinar will be a conversation on rethinking business, forging a new path in the wake of COVID-19. After the presentation, we will use the remaining time for Q&A. As you have questions for our panelists, please enter them into the Q&A box. We will be monitoring the questions as we go. Um, and if we do not have time to get to your question, we're gonna be providing uh, contact information so you can follow up with us afterwards. Um, today's webinar will be more conversational than some of the past webinars we've done. Um, Shuri Abair, CEO of BBR Creative, uh, will kick off our presentation. Uh, and then the conversation will continue with Cian Robinson, Executive Director of Innovation, Research, and Real Estate Investments for Lafayette General Health, um, as well as Missy Rogers, President of Noble Plastics. Later, uh, Destin Ortego, who is the Director of Opportunity Machine, is going to facilitate a Q&A. As a reminder, please uh, do submit questions uh, for our panelists using the Q&A box. I will now turn it over to Cherie Hebert to kick off our presentation. Sharif, the floor is yours. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, like Andre said, I am the CEO of BBR Creative, and I've been in business for over 23 years, and I help businesses build their brand and grow their business. So I'm no stranger to thinking creatively when um, to help a business progress. So this is an unprecedented time for all of us, as we all well know. And as a business owner myself, I empathize with the challenges that we're now facing. Um, this coronavirus pandemic has stopped us all in our tracks. And so, and we all recognize the long-term business and economic consequences of what's going on. And I don't know about you guys, but mostly I've been focused on staying afloat, keeping things running the way they have been. And it's, but it's a shift in the way we're thinking, right? And so no matter what business you're in, whether it's B2B, B2C, uh, goods, services, manufacturing, we're all in the same boat, basically. Um, the coronavirus has, has drastically altered the economic landscape of doing business. And for some of us more drastically than others. So, we're all working at staying home and for most of us that means thinking about our business differently and so today what we're trying to do is just talk to you about how you might we're kind of giving you some insight on how you might start to think about your business differently and shifting the way you've been thinking about doing business and we're going to give you a great example missy and cian are going to be talking through an example of how lafayette general partnered with noble plastics and what solution Noble was able to provide to Lafayette General. At the same time, we might be discussing a few other examples of how businesses have pivoted. So, and then later on, like um, Andre said, we're gonna have a Q&A. But some of the things that um, I've personally observed that have changed during the COVID-19 crisis is that pe obviously people are confined to their homes. Thus, customers have switched to online or otherwise remote solutions. And it shouldn't be assumed that post COVID that they're gonna go back to the way that they were doing it before. So we're gonna all keep some of the same things that we're doing now as we move forward. We've increased the use of desktop over cell phones. More consumers get used to purchasing and doing business through technology. The more apt they are to continue doing that. And we've increased, increased cooking at home, grocery store, online sales have increased, um, contactless payments have increased, email marketing's increased, and people are more interested now in obtaining news with a preference for unbiased facts over opinion. So everybody wants to know the facts now as opposed to listening to 
um, information based on just opinion. And Zoom obviously has become a worldwide phenomena. We're participating in that today. And so, and, and last but not least, but local has never become more important as it is now. I know I've learned that doing business local has made a big comeback and there's an increase in local vendors and suppliers, which is exactly what we're gonna be talking about today. And I know for myself that um, I bank, and I don't, I don't mind saying it, but BBR banks with Home Bank, and they were so instrumental in helping us obtain our PPP loan. And having that local relationship mattered. Um, so I don't mind calling that out. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce you today to CN and Missy, and they're going to be talking about um, a solution that Missy was able to provide to CN. So CN, would you like to take it from there? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, again, CN Robinson, Executive Director of Innovation Research and Real Estate Investments for Lafayette General. Um, it's an honor to be with you this morning. Um, so we were just talking before this, uh, we got started about everybody had to pivot. I mean, you know, we're the billion, billion and 2.2 uh, health system. And all of a sudden our world changed very quickly. Um, some would say almost overnight. And so I, I, I put a list together of all the different pivots we had to make as a health system. And I think I ran out of room on the pad, right? Um, and so I'd like to talk to you about two today, one in brief and then one with uh, Missy and myself uh, in depth. And so, um, you know, we had to, while um, taking care of our employees as well as the community, figure out how to quickly get in front of folks um, in ways that we were no longer allowed. And I think you all understand that our ambulatory surgery, outpatient clinics, primary care sites had to close. And so I um, have had the pleasure over the last six years of working with our senior vice president and CIO, Mike Dozier, on telemedicine. What started off as a few parts spread around the community uh, evolved into a, an entire platform. And, and, and Sheree, you're familiar with the platform. You help us with uh, the marketing of, uh, of Health Anywhere. And we went from seeing maybe 10 to 20 people a day to two to 300 very quickly. And what did that mean? That meant we had to get people credential. That means we had to get the system platform up and running. And so my point in bringing this up in brief is um, businesses need to, no matter how big or small you are, um, businesses have to realize and have something that they are experts in um, to pivot to uh, and deliver. Um, you know, I, we, we've been talking in preparation for this that I've had, I had a software company come to us and start trying to sell us PPE. That's not a fit. That's not a product market fit. That's not a match. And it didn't seem to, um, you know, and, and it didn't work well. Um, but in the instance that Missy and I are going to talk about in bringing up PPE, uh, we had a defined need. And so, again, we have a phenomenal uh, director of uh, system wide supply chain, um, you know, Mr. Lee Perry. And Lee's world just shock, I mean, uh, sh you know, shock and awe, if you would. I mean, it changed again overnight. Over Overnight. And so in some instances, it's estimated anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of our supply chain comes from outside the United States, specifically to healthcare. And with the, 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 the coronavirus, the COVID-19 spreading and workforce being unavailable and then um, national policies changing, our supply chain shut down. Uh, and so Lee and his team had to quickly find ways, creative ways, to continue to protect our employees. And one of those was the production of uh, full face shields and eye shields, goggles. Um, and so we started thinking through, you know, who on, in, our, in our network of contacts um, would be a, a, a good uh, entity to turn to. And what was great was I didn't even have to pick up the phone because Missy Rogers and her husband, Scott, actually called me. And it was very serendipitous. It was, I think we may be all thinking sort of the same wavelength together when the phone call came across because I had on my list of folks to call Missy and Scott. And I got the phone call called in and we had had a prior existing relationship, right? It wasn't uh, one where we were buying product from them. It was, we knew them from one Acadiana, from Lita, from their work in the community. Um, we only have plastics in their name, y'all, right? So um, so we, we, we quickly had a conversation, which was how can you, produce this protective eye, 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 eye gear. And it became very quickly evident that it was gonna take some time for Missy and Scott to get Noble spun up 
And so we had and created an interim solution with also our partners, uh, UL Lafayette, uh, Pelican Engineering, and uh, Pixis uh, to, to, I guess, uh, gap it is the best way to say it, to span that gap. And so Pelican was able to um, 3D print, so was UL able to 3D print um, the, what are, I would call it the frames for our, our, our eye shields and our goggles. UL Lafayette and Pixis were able to provide materials and cut the actual face shields and the goggle wraparound pieces. But the entire time Missy and Scott were engaged, right, through the whole process. So they knew that when we came out of that stopgap measure, that spanning, that they then could move straight into production. And during that entire time while we were doing it, we were also working with Lee Perry and his team to put them into what I would call a second position tier two vendor relationship. So that when we came out of this emergency production of, of materials, we were able to quickly pivot and get Missy and Scott up and running. So it was, a, it was just a wonderful relationship. Um, it wasn't all peaches and cream. There were tons of bumps and hiccups and, you know, should we do this, shouldn't we do this? But what was brilliant was we had one of these. I mean, it was a daily Zoom that there were, it looked like the Brady Bunch, right, um, on my screen, uh, where we, we were constantly talking and working through the challenges and problems. And um, couldn't be happier. Um, you know, Missy and Scott and the Noble Plastics team are just top notch. And we hope that, you know, the good side, the upside of this is they've now entered a new marketplace where they weren't before. And we've helped them in some way, shape, or form, I'd like to think maybe too arrogantly or a little bit hubris hanging in there, but I hope we help them uh, create a new product. So, a new product. so before this, Missy, before this, um, this opportunity with Lafayette General, did you work in health, did you produce any pieces or work in healthcare at all? Uh, very, very limitedly. Uh, it's fortunate that in years past, we had had exposure to inventors who had something in a medical space. We had an FDA registration uh, in hand, although we didn't need it for this. But we knew enough to know who we were, what we could do, and what we couldn't. And so we had made the decision many years ago not to specialize as a medical molder. We didn't know the certifications uh, intimately and, and the supply chain intimately. And so I think for a lot of business owners, there are areas and markets that you might not view as your primary and maybe even have had a little bit of exposure to them that were less than comfortable. But now is the time to think about what does or doesn't fit as a pivot and, and CN brought up a great um, opportunity with us in that he didn't ask us to do something beyond our capability. He didn't ask us to go into gowns. He didn't ask us to go into artificial hips. He didn't ask us to go into things that are inserted in a human body. He said, look, there's a large class of medical support products that have different tiers of qualifications you could fill this gap, whereas there may be other people who could fill other gaps. And I think that was important for us is to still support and honor the customers that we have and know who we are, like CN said, but how much of a, of a stretch um, should we be taking at this time and knowing where to pull back and, and draw back from that. And so you wouldn't want a software company to suddenly say, well, I guess we could buy sewing machines and sew. And I, and I suppose if it's the survival of the species, you might do that. But from a business standpoint, it, it's, it's trying to define where that line is. And in a medical industry, it pretty clearly comes with the certifications, qualifications, and regulations. But I'm sure a lot of our attendees are thinking in other ways, like um, I was on a call earlier with a candy maker. Love candy, right? Well, pretty basic idea. Knowing what you know about the market today that you didn't know 60 days ago, do you think they're more likely to make packaged fun size individually sealed candies versus bags of just big open candy that hands reach in. 
Well, that wasn't even a pivot for them so much as a fine tuning of their product line. There will not be as much demand for bulk packaging. There will be much more demand for individual servings and portions. So um, many of our attendees should be thinking about things like that. Um, I know, Cherie, you said one of your clients uh, has been very successful with that. I, I, yeah, I was going to mention that. So um, my friend Boyer DeReese with uh, Good Eats Kitchen is a good example to me about um, a pivoting without changing your business, which is what you're talking about. Like we're not suggesting people go out and invent a brand new business right now. We're talking about pivoting based on core competency. So Boyer, the example that I have for him is that he provides chef prepared meals to the public and he has... Uh, two different storefronts and one in Baton Rouge, et cetera. And, and he's been really hit by this and it's individual meals, but you know, it requires a lot of like walk in business. So what he did was he just decided, look, I'm going to take the ingredients that I used to make these high quality meals and I'm going to package them in boxes and ship and sell chef prepared boxes via a marketplace on my website. And so he was able, and this is another point, And I think about this as a marketer, um, he had a great list of his customer base to begin with. So owning your customer base is super important because he was easily able to reach out to all his customers and say, look, I'm not going to have these meals anymore, but I will have this grocery box that you can pick up and drive through at curb service. And now you can buy this high end grocery product from me. So I know I buy like maybe once every week or two weeks, this box of great produce from him. So he pivoted enough just to keep himself in business in the interim, because obviously when this is over, he's probably going to go back to the way he was doing things before or some variation of that. So it's, and I'm sure we can all, the creativity is about, it's, it's just, there's so much ingenuity going on right now, but that's another example. And Missy, yeah. didn't, you, didn't, you had an example where you got pulled in to produce ventilator parts, right? And you had a, like a, a, punch list of 80 some odd parts you could produce, right? Yes, we got the call as part of the GM outreach for ventilation uh, manufacturers and uh, it trickled down to the little guys, but uh, they were just slammed for, for RFQs, uh, for requests for quote. And so hundreds of parts were just being released in prints and specifications. And we were shown 84 plastic parts that went into this ventilator. It was a late Saturday night. We called up our team. Uh, a lot of the engineers went in Sunday morning uh, to try and see what we could tackle. And one of the first things I said is take a deep breath. Don't worry about trying to quote 84 things. Go through the list first and pick the things that currently fit in resins we already have, machinery we already have, things we've already run. Because maybe we stretch a little bit if there's a more urgent need for some of these other things, but the first pass should be those things clearly within our capability. And so there were like 14 of the 84 that we said, oh, we already run this, oh, we already run this, we already run this. So particularly when your resources are strained, <clears throat> excuse me, when your resources are strained and you have limited people and you have a time sensitive issue, you could be scattered and chasing after things you couldn't win or service well. And so being strategic about prioritizing those opportunities, again, goes to your fit. Your grocery guy didn't say, well, let me expand my services in junk food and frozen food product because that's not what he was about. He was about healthy and fresh. So he expanded within healthy and fresh. We were about these, these uh, engineering grade thermoplastics. So that's what we quoted, not the things and processes that, that we did not have command and control over. And, and Missy, the, the product that, you know, you're going to end up producing that we were producing um, with UL and Pelican and, and, and PIX is, you know, it was NIH, S, you know, FDA approved, right? That was that design. So we knew 
Um, and, 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 and this is specific to healthcare, but it's also across other industries. There are regulatory hurdles that you have to go come across. And you know, healthcare is hard for a reason. There is, it's a highly regulated market. And so we didn't come to you and say, hey, I want you to produce this you know, com complex thing that's gonna require, it's called a 510K approval process, which takes a long time, or an FDA letter that says, no, we're in a pandemic, you can produce it. It was pre-approved, ready to go, and you know, able to be, to be produced. And I think, you know, you know, Cherie's talked about, and you know, you just talked about, it, it's that product market fit. It's knowing your customer and, or knowing your potential customer. I mean, and you know, and we've seen a ton of great local companies that, um, that have helped us, right? That have pivoted to spaces that they're good at, that they know, that they know they can help us with. So I'll, I'd like to talk about that for one, one second. And that's considering what your customers need now as opposed to what they needed before the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And so um, I know that Andre is going to upload a, a, a piece, a downloadable document um, that we created for him that just gives you some thought provoking questions to ask yourself about how, what does my, but this is the essence of it, right? What does the customer, and in your case, in Noble and Lafayette General, it might have been a new relationship, but in most of the cases of the folks watching today, you have to ask yourself, what does my customer need today that was, is different from what they needed yesterday? And that's a good way to start the brainstorming session because you're basically trying to solve a new problem. And what is the new problem you're going to solve? And, and so, I mean, I'll just give you very little simple idea. My hairdresser, when she got shut down, she basically dropped off in my mailbox hair color with instru and texted instructions on how to do it myself because <laughs> she still wanted to keep, she wanted to keep her customer base, right? right? And she wanted to make sure that we all had, you know, that today, I didn't show my gray roots, so she did that for me. But she did it for all her customers, and I thought it was a way of thinking about what I needed, right? Versus what she needed, it was what I needed. And so I, I think that if we try to start, we, we need to think differently about what our clients and customers need more of now. And a lot of times, even if it comes to billing and things like that, my business, you know, reaching out to each one of our clients and saying, look, do you need a reprieve for a little while on this retainer agreement? Do, um, is this something we need? I'll put a halt on for a minute. Um, just trying to be flexible and nimble in how we serve. Well, and, and part of what, what CM was talking about specifically with the, this, this other group of, of vendors, they may or may not be capable of the high scale mass production that we are but there is that gap opportunity. Yeah. And so we couldn't fill the gap and maybe the gap guys can only sustain this for a brief period before they have to take care of their primary customers. But there's, there's lots of places for opportunity wherever you are in that supply chain to, 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 to look and see adjacent uh, paths. If you think about the, the, the links of services and products that your company provides, uh, the people you buy from, the people you sell to, you might need to stretch a little bit into in, into neighboring parts of that supply chain. Um, right. Much like your service provider of the, the salon says, you know what, let me be a product supplier for a time too. Um, and she may not do that forever, but, but it may be a way to um, stretch a little bit. You know, you pivot into your strengths. You don't pivot into a new space at this point in time, right? I, I you know, Sheree, I, you know, I've had the pleasure of talking to, you know, a, a bunch of local companies, um, you know, coming in and saying, hey, we think we can supply you this or we can supply you that. And it's always been, oh, wow, that's a great idea. It needs work. Put a pin in it for afterwards because you're not going to have time to work on that idea in the middle of a pandemic necessarily please pivot into your strengths what how can you help us with these defined needs that we have and again for us i mean you know there were a ton of other needs but ppe became that sort of you know very quick focus because you know mr perry's entire world got shook up i mean overnight and he needed to keep us 
you know, all the frontline, not us, not me. You don't want to see me in a clinical world, y'all. That's just saying. But, you know, um, you know, you know, you know, all our clinicians that were, you know, on the front line, you know, still taking care of people, they needed to be safe. So how do we fix that? And and again, it was that creative problem solving and working with some wonderful companies like Missy's so we can pivot to their strength and help them help us out. Awesome. Um, so I actually have um, a little quick list of some things that um, you guys can do. And so one of them is um, it, it kind of piggybacks off of what uh, CN just said, and that's brainstorming from the position of what you do best. So understanding what your wheelhouse is, what do you do best? And sometimes it requires just looking at yourself from an, and your business from a new perspective and saying, okay, what are the things we do best and where can we fit a need? And, you know, sometimes talking to other people about where you stand, what the need, there's some obvious things going on in the world right now, but sometimes it takes somebody else to kind of bring it to, to light for us. Um, a good place is also, what are the challenges that you as a business are facing and strategize in different scenarios that take different positions into account? And, so there's been a lot of disruption in the world. And so we have to kind of look at our, look at our situations from a new point of view. And sometimes it's a little difficult to do, but it's almost like giving a, doing a SWOT analysis of your own business. Yes. I, I really do believe that, um, like I said earlier, that looking at um, servicing clients from their perspective, and I, I know that most of you on this call today are, more from the B2B sector, business to business versus business to consumer. And so, you know, if you're in the business to business, and I'm going to just throw a little marketing piece in there, from a B2B perspective, connections and outreach, and I, I, I do something every day I'm calling COVID connections, and I just reach out to different people that I've had relationships with and try to shore up and have conversations with different folks in order to get new perspective about what's going on and about how we, and, and ultimately about how we might serve our clients differently. So it's, you can definitely be networking during a time like this, just to have a better understanding of what your market's like. Um, you know, and, and of course, if you do pivot, you have to think about what's, what's that gonna look like in the future. But at this point, I think everybody's sort of in, um, we're all in uh, emergency mode. <laughs> and so we're trying to, you know, just we're trying to think creatively. Um, and this is some very simple things, but I would like to offer this little bit of advice. Communicate to your audiences that you're still in business. Uh, and I know it sounds crazy, but I, I, the other day I was trying to buy something locally and I couldn't figure out if the company was open for business or not. And so please, reach out to your audience and let them know, hey, we're still in business doing, and if it's adjusted hours or it's limited time, whatever, but you need to let them know. Um, also, continue marketing, networking, and outreach. Like I said, you can still have lots of conversations with people. And obviously you wouldn't be on this call if you wouldn't be continuing to seek knowledge and uncover resources. And so that's something you can always do. And um, you might have to obviously use alternative mo uh, solutions to maintain your daily operations. And I know we use Google Hangouts a whole lot as a business. We use Slack a whole lot. It's a great alternative to email. Mm -hmm. um, we use Google Docs. There's something called Trello or Stormboard that you can use for remote brainstorming. So those are some of the tools that we at BBR use to continue our operations. And we haven't really missed a beat. As a matter of fact, March was a better billing month than February. And I think everybody was just so focused on keeping their jobs and doing the best we could for our clients that they just really busted it, you know? <laughs> so we were fortunate in that way, but we're a lagging in, uh, you know, our industry, industry is sort of like a lagging industry. So I expect to have more, um, you know, fallout from all of this more toward the summer. But obviously we're not a restaurant who's been immediately affected and who has like extreme challenges right now. And I know that that's sometimes, you know, it's a weighted out kind of thing and that's very difficult. So I do empathize with those folks. Um, 
Sure. Anyway, I do think I, your your first point was so key. It's one of those simple things that I had overlooked. Uh, we were maybe a week into this and uh, having a having a management meeting, and someone said, "Well, have we updated our website to include a, a flash blurb at the top that we're operating?" And I thought, "No. I mean, we're not really a retail establishment, I and mean, we have office hours, of course." And I thought, you know what? yeah, I need to know who's open and who's not open. And it was as simple as we're operating, we're up, uh, but we're not allowing vendor or customer visits. And so we could set that expectation. That way nobody uh, gets frustrated with lack of response. And so if you are a, a, a salon, if you are a restaurant, if you have changed how you're delivering services, Communication is the key. I think that's the number yeah. one way to yeah. combat fear. And so whether it's your social media posts or your website or, or like BBR, giving, giving a direct call to those customers can be at least the first step that even if they're also dealing with uncertainty, they know that you reached out. They know that, that you make contact with them. And, and contact and networking is exactly how the relationship with CN and Lafayette General came about. You know, well, I, I want to piggyback off of that one I thing because it hit me right away that our clients who had relationships and a method of communication directly with their customers or clients had a jump start on everybody else. So it's not too late for you either to build, whether it's email marketing, um, whether it's setting up an email marketing program, whether it's and making sure you have everybody's email addresses and phone numbers. Some people don't even have databases of their clients, right? So that one activity is the thing everybody who's on this call should have in place. And, and um, Sharita, I was about to say the exact same thing. Um, even if you're a sole proprietor or maybe a small business with a couple, three people, you don't need elaborate, right? This is, no. you, know, if you, you know, you need make that, you know, go into your list and make that call, right? You may have 10, 12 clients, you may have 200 clients, but make sure you make that contact, right? Make sure that social media, if you have a page is updated, if you're able to update a website, but at minimum, I mean, your killer app is your phone, right? Pick up the phone and get a voice to just say, hey, Missy, we're still in business. You know, we're still open. You know, please, you know, please use us. Hey, Cherie, you know, thank you very much. I do need an email marketing campaign, please help. You know, um, there's just different simple, um, you know, relatively inexpensive ways that these sole proprietors and smaller businesses, I think when we were on the, you know, getting ready for the call, I, you know, I, you know, and without arrogance or hubris, I know we're a, a you know, $1 billion, $1.2 billion health system, right? I get that. And I get the pressure we were under, but it's like going down in the ocean, right? And the deeper you go, the more pressure you get. I can only imagine the pressure it must be to be like individuals of such as yourselves with you know, define small businesses or even those micro home based businesses that have been just substantially impacted by this. And what are they going to do and how are they going to do it? I mean, the, the pressure that they're all under is so extreme and so severe. It is. So yeah, I, I think, think I that think a lot of that goes back to just the basics kind of Cherie was hitting on uh, marketing. You know, who are you? What are you strong at? who could use or should use your services, um, you know, who are your customers or who could your customers be. And the closer that is to the pre-crisis, post-crisis, the easier it is. So, so you, you've got that kind of inner circle of existing stable clients. You've got that immediate next circle, which was contacts that are established that maybe haven't been customers, but you've bid things and, and you should reach out to those guys immediately uh, as your next ring of potential relationships. You've got the, the, the larger market of who you could reach out to. And I think part of what Cian was saying earlier that bears repeating again is buying local doesn't just mean a local restaurant or a local salon it largely is these business to business contacts 
because the way purchasing and the way supply chains are being filled right now has completely been thrown out the window is everybody's kind of having to be Radar O'Reilly. And it's not about, does my catalog get filled? It's who do I know that I can call and make a deal with? And um, that, whether you're the single proprietor or a multi-billion dollar business, people are still the ones making these decisions. People are still the ones knowing what can and can't be um, circumvented or, or alleviated as far as, like you said, qualifications, certifications and things. Um, your customers can tell you what their barriers are. And Missy, I'm, I'm going to tell you um, from a healthcare perspective and a national security perspective, um, I think our supply chain is going to be forever changed so that there's a certain amount that remains on shore so that we have the noble plastics of the world that are tier two providers. Um, because this is not if it's going to happen again, it's when. We don't know if it's going to be another pandemic or uh, a, you know, a sociopolitical issue. Um, we don't know what it's gonna be, but we, we now know that we have to be able to quickly turn to the Noble Plastics and say, okay, you've been producing a few thousand of these per week, you know, per week for us, right? We've had you on contract. All right, let's turn up the, you know, the, now you're gonna be doing tens of thousands, very good, right? Um, you know, and, and, and I think for our, our, our attendees, that's a, you know, put a pin in it, but think about the future there is going to be a pivot towards local and onshore, right? And so what does that mean for them being any size business and what, how can they take advantage of that? Now I wanna, and to piggyback on that, at BBR, we are a creative agency that we're always thinking of, you know, we're developing campaigns and ideation around marketing and messaging, but that same extra brainstorming exercise is what we're talking about now with you taking a new look at your business in terms of, the brainstorming exercise. I mean, you can Google brainstorming exercises and practice that, that activity, okay? Because it, it's truly an activity that helps you think differently. So I encourage that. But the second thing, I think CN and Missy really proved that the importance of networking and the importance of relationships. If we all come down, those are two fundamental things that don't, as a business owner or a that is the essence of how business gets done. And so um, I guess use this time, I would just recommend anyone to use this time to craft how in the future you have stronger B2B relationships for your future and, and, and use that time to build those. Um, because it's, I know for myself and building BBR as a brand and a business, networking and, and meeting people and, 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 and that type of interaction was fundamental to our growth as an agency. So Destin, I think it's time for you to feel the Q and A's, right? Like maybe he's right. on mute. Let me go it. Making sure that you don't hear me typing in the background here. All right, so the first question that we have, a uh, two-part question, it seems like it might be a little more focused on marketing. So Shri is our marketing guru of the panel. Uh, you may want to take this one, uh, but we encourage all panelists to, to answer. Uh, so in reference to something Missy said right at the end there, where buying local is not necessarily, from a customer uh, point of view, you're not really connecting the dots with some of the other local organizations who need that local support as well. And one of them is a travel agency. Uh, so Robbie B is asking that uh, a two part question, one of his lack of concern, interest or understanding in defining buying local as including the use of local travel agencies. Uh, so we'll start off by answering that. And what would be some recommendations uh, for having the travel agency push that or promote that to the local customers? I don't think just telling folks that, you know, oh, this is why, you know, use us by local. You have to give good examples of the value of using a travel agency locally, right? So I would use like case scenarios using social media, for example, and let your customers speak about the value of it. And uh, in my opinion, probably with a travel agent, it's getting stuck somewhere or not having somebody to call when you were stuck. If I traveled somewhere and I got stuck, I want some examples of the way that having a local travel agency saved the day for me. So my first thing, if I were in Robbie's shoes, I would contact 
uh, get a, a bunch of clients, tell the stories of a bunch of clients that this worked well for, because you're going to, you're going to be, somebody else is going to be able to promote you better than you are yourself for in that instance. Is that the, is that the question? Did I Absolutely. answer the question? And Robbie, um, man, your industry has been rocked. I mean, and it's not right. gonna, it's not gonna come back the way it used to. We were talking about for the call. Seems like our, you know, um, yeah. is everything all right? Yeah. Destin. Destin seems we're to here. have disappeared. All right, so for, I'm gonna just continue until Destin shows back up or Andre steps in. Um, you know, Robbie, you, you, your, your industry is completely, completely rocking. It's not going to, I don't think it's going to come back the same way it, it, it was before, right? Um, uh, it, yeah, it seems it, like it, right now, all corporations are, are looking at, you know, I can think of this from the general side. We're looking at the way, should we be traveling or shouldn't we be traveling? Uh, and if we are, you know, what's, what's the importance? Or can we do it via one of these things? Um, so I, I do think you need to start to ideate a little bit about the way that, the travel industry is going to emerge from this pandemic <clears throat> and then really begin, as Cherie said, to start to tell the story of your value proposition. What value do you bring to your client? And I think you have multiple clients, you have businesses and individuals, right? What value do you bring to your clients and how can you deliver that value? Uh, is, well, is that I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm looking forward to getting out of this house and going on some kind of trip. And I'm looking forward to doing it with my family. So family trips, in my opinion, family trips may be a great little bucket of things that you can offer special family trips, whether that's in state probably initially. But how can you put package deals together for family trips? And how do you promote that kind of idea and take the burden off of one person in the family, me, having to come up with the family trip. So, I mean, it's just kind of analyzing where are people today, you know, because I think people are going to be interested in traveling as soon as this is lifted, but it's who knows when that's going to happen, right? Okay, so I'm back on. It looks like my video is too much for my internet connection right now. So we're going to go uh, with just the, the blank screen. Uh, so the, the second part of the question is looking at, and this is something that restaurants are also fighting with as well, and so selling for the future since your point of sale or using your point of sale and then you split between fear and product availability. Uh, and so what is the best approach for selling for the future? So for restaurant industry, you know, you have these gift cards that you're selling now to try and make up for, but you're going to have to redeem that later on. But then also in the travel agency selling for the future when knowing that people, it may not, get to where it needs to be for people to feel comfortable traveling uh, what would be the best approach there hmm. i'll well, jump in on that and and, and some of it is just <clears throat> excuse me a, a matter much like much like the reason we're all uh, staying at home is to flatten the curve so from a business model standpoint you're you're exchanging cash now for cash later right you're, you're selling, uh, you're pre-booking a trip, you're, you're selling a gift card, and yes, there will be the consequence later of you'll have people in, but it's not like everyone's going to come in the same night and all want to use a gift card and no cash goes into the register. So there are strategies you can take to move some of that revenue into the current period, even if you won't realize the cost until later. And I, I'm not an accountant, but, but I have to make payroll. And so strategies like that, um, if you've not explored them, um, loyalty cards, things that are gonna encourage continued use. Um, one of the questions um, that I saw, Destin, about a product uh, for, for me and seeing is one of the nice things about this particular product for us is that it's not just going to fill a need for six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks. It's a product that we decided to invest the time and startup costs into because we know that we'll be able not just to have some, some uh, legs, you know, so, some income from this product currently, but it's something that we'll be able to um, sell into a marketplace larger even than this one customer. 
And so that that's really a win for everybody. It's a win for CN, it's a win for us, it's a win for the people who are dependent on PPE. And so when you always think about how your customer wins with you, mm-hmm. it's not choose one. It, the best solutions have multiple winners. And so you need to think about what is it that customer needs? What is it more customers like that customer needs? And how you multiply that win across a really diverse field of, of customers. Well said. All right. So the next question is specifically for Missy Rogers. What products do you begin producing for the healthcare company or the uh, healthcare industry? So CN had alluded to it earlier. It's basically a, a plastic band. It's a mounting frame that is uh, adjustable at the back with rubber bands or ties or whatever, um, to which is affixed a replaceable shorter term use face shield. And so there's a, a, a durable product that gets reused, sanitized, wiped down as necessary, and a disposable product And again, it's, well, why would we choose to make that when we could have made goggles, when we could have made, uh, you know, something else? And part of it is that blend of risk and that blend of quantity with something that endures and something that is replaceable. So so it's a pretty good spot to be in Um, morally. We, we like to help and, and to be part of the solution. And so it's not about a, a, a profit model, but you still have to be thinking about how does this fit in your business? How does it fit with your staffing? How does it fit with the kind of labor uh, profile that you have for um, your workforce? And, and part of it is, um, the, that longer term look, right? I, because my industry is capital heavy, because my industry requires a lot of startup expenses, it doesn't make sense for my business to do something for a week or two. Uh, you know, like you see and said, there was a gap that several weeks we had to get tooling up, we had to get processes up. And so if you're in a business with a very short development time, you can service a client with a very short need time. My business has a lot of setup and development time, so I need to pick products with a long selling cycle. Missy, you're, you, the product that we, we settled on, um, you know, so it, it has a durable piece, it has multiple clicks, right? Multiple uses. It was, uh, so you have the, you're giving away the razor to sell the razor blades a little bit, right? Um, it was a relatively low risk, high volume, multiple product market fits. So not only for us, but there are federal government contracts out there for FEMA, for NIH, all different areas that need this exact product produced for them, right? And you also had varying levels of a willingness to purchase, right? So you had a range of, you know, FEMA might pay a little bit more because it's in the emergency situation and you need to have it produced immediately, right? Us, we're going to look at it as saying you're tier two because we get other stuff that is uh, maybe more cheaply produced um, overseas, but we need to now make sure we have that um, security blanket that it's in our backyard, right? So I think, again, knowing what your company's um, strengths are, um, knowing how to pivot to those strengths and provide products and services that you, your, your client essentially helps you design. And I think, Sheree, you, you asked me to use this phrase when we were talking before. It's don't be a solution looking for a problem, right? I see so many entrepreneurs that come to me for investment from one of our innovation funds that are solutions looking for a problem. Identify the problem. And if you can't do it with your client, right, your potential client, and identify that problem and then go into your strengths and provide the solution. I mean, God knows it's a difficult conversation you have to have, but you just, you know, um, without being too pejorative, it's sort of a bless your heart moment, I think is the best way to put it. Um, um, but uh, 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 so I, again, I couldn't echo um, Missy's comments more. I mean, it's been a, you know, I, I liked her and Scott before. I really like her and Scott now. And I think there are additional opportunities to continue to move forward uh, on so other, other products. Yes, ma'am. 
So, uh, but the reason you had to reach out to Missy was because you were unable to get any product like that. I mean, that was the, that was the, or the, lead, or the lead time on delivering the product was weeks or months away. And respectfully, I mean, in one of the products, we were down to an average daily inventory of one day. Like we were one, well, it was a little bit more, 1.2 days of supply on hand, right? And that's when we pivoted and said, okay, interim providers, Pelican and UL and Pixis, let's get this spun up while Missy gets spun up. So we can go from producing several hundred a day and turning them into the hospital to make sure everybody was protected and safe to several thousand a day with the tooling and the, you know, the capital intensive uh, nature of, of Missy's business, right? Uh, so it was, it was a, a wonderful uh, you know, uh, solution. solution. And the terminology for people that might not be familiar, tier one, tier two, I'm not gonna replace CNs overseas through this whole supplier network of the guys that are making millions and millions and millions of these things, because I didn't tool up a whole factory to make these things. So a tier two is like a surge supplier. So they're still gonna buy whatever, 10 million from their primary source, but they also now have a little skin in the game that if they want a local supplier who in the event of a trade disruption, a storm, a tsunami, a dock workers strike or a pandemic, if sure. they said, look, how am I gonna get 50,000 of these? Oh wait, here are these people. So we've been giving them a little bit of business this whole time, maybe at a premium. Uh, we have other customers who as they onshore or reshore have said, well, you know, we pay whatever, 17 cents in China what's your best price? I'm like, I can't touch 17 cents, but I can do it for 22. Right. Like, well, great. You won't be our primary, but you can be the one that either fills that gap or in the absence of the primary um, uh, is the primary supplier. So think about for your business, even those things that you might not be the absolute primary solution for, what can you be the secondary solution for? Because enough of those guys can keep you busy and expand your business. Well said. Great. So the next question we hear we have here um, from Coble. I hope I'm saying that right. And uh, first of all, they want to say congratulations, CN and Missy, for this innovative approach to serve our healthcare providers. And he gave a great example of how the leniency on guidelines and restrictions by the federal government has allowed his company. Uh, to hedge forward quickly. His question is, do we think that post COVID-19 more restrictions will again be applied? So, uh, hey, so, hey, Destin, I think I know who that is. I think it's Karen Weibel. I think she's, uh, uh, she's a friend. Karen Weibel, there you go. All right. Um, uh, so, uh, so when it's Karen, all bunched Karen, together, it's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's awesome. Um, so Karen, I, I, I do think that um, some restrictions will remain loose, but other things will tighten down, I, I think is the answer. So for example, the remain loose telemedicine, I mean, they made it, uh, they essentially came in and said, boom, you can do telemedicine, we'll pay for it, right? And that, if, for you all who don't know, that hadn't been the case for Medicare. I mean, had been, we've been driving forward, try to get that payment model in place, and suddenly the payment model opened up. Same thing with Medicaid and the managed, you know, managed care organizations called MCOs, the Medicaid managed care organizations in our state. Some of them said yes to telemedicine, some of them said no. Well, the governor and the federal government said, you're going to say yes across the board. And so that cow is so far out of the board that I don't think it's coming back. And I think telemedicine, the delivery of healthcare through telemedic platforms is here to stay. It's going to be a new modality, right? But then Karen, to, to, to your point, I do think that there's going to be a ratcheting down of the supply chain. I think this has become a national security issue. And I think the federal government, um, you know, and, 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 and respectfully, I think Missy gets some contracts because of her different designations that she's, you know, hustled and gone through to get, right? Uh, female owned, veteran owned, you know, small business, right? Just female. Um, I think, just female. Just female? Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. So, so, um, sorry. So the thought process there is, is the federal government when they have prime contracts, require prime contractors to subcontract to small female businesses, okay? And there has to be so much purchase from them. I really think that that's a part of a pivot that we're gonna see in a policy shift. 
that they're going to require this national security issue that showed up that this production a certain percent of it of it may remain onshore um, and um, and to support the missies of the world and other companies that choose to invest um, but uh, you know again and I'm, I'm operating from the healthcare environment I do think that you know there are going to be changes to how we do business in the future um, and policies and perhaps procedures that we implement that you know, we've yet to touch on, but will change. Um, you know, just a simple something like, um, y'all, we used to allow people into the, and, you know, if you wanted to see mama in the hospital, you can go and there could be five or six people around her bed, right? Um, it, you're, you're not allowed in the hospital now. Uh, do I think it's going to be that forever? No. But I also think it's going to be ratcheted up maybe to a handful of people once they're in. And Karen, I would love to see what infection rates look like now that we haven't had a whole bunch of people coming in and out of the building, right? There's those things that we're gonna to have to ideate, noodle around, pull some data and look at that um, it just won't give it back. And, and I wanted to jump in on the small business side. Uh, Sian brings up a great point. Um, there are many of you who perhaps have not gone through the Small Business Development Center or Alita or Opportunity Machine, but we have PTAC and a lot of uh, resources yeah. locally that can get you recognized and certified if you are woman owned, veteran owned, minority owned, uh, disability owned. But I will tell you this, to my knowledge, I have yet to win one piece of business in 20 years because I'm a female owner. I have never had anyone tell me that as a woman owner, I won this bid. You still have to have quality. You still have to provide value. The difference is, and that is true, I agree with Cian, that larger buying entities are probably going to be incentivized by the government to do more spend into these diverse supplier bases. And so if you happen to be someone who could qualify as a diverse supplier, now's a really good time to get a consult and get that accreditation because they're, if they have a, a 25 or 30% spend target with a diverse supplier and their supply chain doesn't contain anyone who is diverse, they're going to be calling government entities like LIDA, like one Acadiana, like all of your economic development authorities in St. Landry Parish and Vermilion and Iberia. And they're going to say things like, hey, do you know you have any local companies that are woman owned, veteran owned, right. uh, uh, minority owned right. or disadvantaged? Well, I could piggyback onto that. I've been WBEC, well, w, it's called WeBank, uh, Women Business Enterprise National Comp uh, Certification. Anyway, for 23 years, basically I've been certified for 20 years and I have never won a piece of business because I'm a minority owned, women owned business. However, when we bid on state projects or larger larger projects there is in the scoring process there is a line item that says you know there's a 10 10 points given if you were a minority owned business so it does help you and there's the hudson and for the state of louisiana for led you can get hudson certified and that's another accreditation that allows small business to um have a more equal playing field so to your point about naming all those great resources, also the state economic development small business entity for, you can go to the website opportunitylouisiana.com. You can find out a lot of resources for small businesses and you should look into that during this time period if you haven't already to, um, to help you because to your point, supplier diversity is with major companies it is a real thing and there are di supplier diversity representatives who are looking to do business with folks like you and on a national basis missy i can totally imagine now moving forward that there's going to be more of that going on um but to your point you know i i've never been i've never gotten any kind of contract just because i'm a woman-owned business well and i was going to say it's because you guys are quality right mm -hmm. So you, you use the designation to help you get the points on the contract or the, you know, to, to, to float to the top. But at the end of the day, if you don't deliver, you're done, right? 
And so you, right. both of yours, your abilities to deliver a quality solid product every single time is the key. Great. So, so we, have, uh, we have one more time. time for one more question. So uh, at the beginning of the webinar, we talked a little bit about finding potential customers. So obviously you have your target customers that you may be dealing directly with right now, but due to new needs that have come about or changes in the economy, uh, there's potential for new customers to service to help kind of uh, help you along until things kind of get somewhat back to normal. So, and are there any tips, tricks, tools that any of you use processes for finding these potential new customers and validating them uh, and then starting to service them? And I'll leave that open to all three panelists. I already hit on that once, which is um, for us, it, we, we decided it was going to be easier to retouch people with whom we had quoted work but not want it, who already had some knowledge of us, who had met us previously, whether through a networking event, an educational event, a lunch and learn or something like that, than just to start marketing to an untouched audience. And so I just think, again, it's that, it's that kind of priority of who's already in who's a near touch you know who who is as close as you can get to winning business um but i leave the marketing to those professionals well um i think what i the thing i would suggest would be take a look at um your client base or the customers you have successfully served and look at those that you've had the best relationship with and enjoyed the work the most and for actually provided the most results to and and really really take a hard look at them and say what did we do well for these folks and what what was the value to them what value did we bring to the table and then try to mimic that over again and make a hot list of like who could I go after and do the same thing because it's a great case study right and so it helps you expand when you just go through that simple exercise of evaluating who you did your best work for now, of course, we're in a state of flux, so things have changed a lot, but I still think there are certain clients that, in, in my business, that we've done an exceptional job for that we can look at and say, what were all the traits that allowed that to happen and, and repeat it? And Sherry, I think I'm on the other side of the coin from you too, right? So I have the use of the world coming inbound, right? And, and so first off, I, I you know, one of the fun parts of, of this pandemic, if there's a fun part, has been engaging with the Noble Plastics and the other small local vendors of the world to learn about their products and services. But to the point Missy and I talked about before, we already had a pre-existing relationship. It wasn't a, a supplier buyer relationship. Um, so I think you know your network and going into your network that you've established and continue to establish is gonna be extremely important and you know, making sure that you can get to the right person in the organization that you're trying to sell to is key, right? And so I know, um, for example, you know, folks will approach my boss, David Calicott, who's the president of the health system all the time about new opportunities and so on and so forth. And so what happens is it gets pivoted over to me and he's like saying, go take the meeting, sit down, talk to the company. And, you know, and, and many times, very honestly, there's not going to be a buyer seller relationship there quite yet. It's going to take time. Um, and you have to cultivate those relationships so that when the opportunity shows up to do to do it, it's already in our head. It's top of mind. Um, and y'all, prior to joining the health system, I was in your shoes. I was a small business owner, right? Um, and so I knew what how difficult that was. And so if, if I would leave it with one thing, it's all about relationships. It is all about cultivating the relationships with your current clients target market potential, future clients, and being involved in the community so that people know who you are and when it's time to, to buy the product or service. And that doesn't cost advertising dollars. <laughs> no, it does. And I think that's a great way to end. Uh, and also a great plug for some of our partner organizations on the webinars like One Acadiana. Um, so thank you for that. And 
Thank you very much to Cherie Bear, Cian Robinson, Missy Rogers, and Destin Ortego um, for leading today's discussion, which, which was a very informative discussion and um, hopefully helpful um, to all of you that joined. Um, we did record the webinar um, and we're gonna be sharing the video recording um, with everyone afterwards, posting it on our website, along with the, the download document that Cherie mentioned as well. So uh, stay tuned for those materials, stay tuned for more information about um, our ongoing Acadiana Business Resource Webinar Series. Uh, we look forward to offering more webinars going forward. Um, and once again, uh, we wanna really thank our panelists today. Thank all of you for joining us uh, and please stay safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care.